Uh, we're here to talk about new and different approaches to contracting or what the trends are in federal contracting to try and in many ways reinvent the way we do business so that we can stay abreast of uh, the current technologies, the current uh, inventions, the current ways of doing business uh, with, in, in regard with industry. So we have several people, leaders here on the panel, and as we go along, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves more fully. But we have uh, Mr. Alan Thomas, who is from GSA. He is the administrator for the federal, I'm sorry. Commissioner. Commissioner, Commissioner I'm sorry. The, the administrator Commissioner, yeah, well, I gave you, I that's true, I gave you a raise. Yeah. Uh, the Commissioner of the Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, we have Chris Heitz, who's the first uh, Director of Acquisitions at DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit. We have Dave Drabkin, who is currently the Director of GovCon Consulting, but more famously was the Chairman of the Section 809 panel. And then we have Steven Rodriguez, who is the founding partner of One Defense. And so what I, what I plan to hear this, this morning is to let each of them talk about topics near and dear to their heart or, or trends that they're seeing or innovations that they're seeing happen within the federal government. And especially for Stephen, uh, talk about how industry perceives we're doing in terms of acquisition and some of the things that need to be changed or things that are going well. I'll have a few questions for them after that and then please make sure you send your questions to the app because I have the tablet up here and we'll just go through and answer as many questions as we can. So, Mr. Thomas? Good. We're not going to go old, my aunt, we're not going to go old school and just have people ask questions. I'm going to send everybody Apparently out. not. Okay, yes. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so I, I asked Dave if I could just do a reading from the uh, from the 809 report, and he said no, no uh, I can't do that. That would be stealing his um, his lines. So thanks. 2,700 pages. 20, yeah. <laughs> quick, give us a quick synopsis. Uh, so th so thanks uh, for having us here today. Uh, thanks to Jerry uh, and the uh, the GovCon Center and to uh, and to DAU. Um, it's a it's a good topic. I was kind of when I was sort of reflecting on you know what to talk about initially. I was thinking it's a topic that's probably about as old as the country, right? In terms of you know we've probably been thinking about um, how to how to be more innovative and in how we acquire things since since literally we raised the Continental Army, right? Um, and there have been you know a lot of a lot of good ideas uh, over the years. I remember when I first got in the Pentagon in you know 1994 95, there was sort of a wave of acquisition reform. Dave Dave was there right in the middle uh, of much of that. Uh, you know, so, we, so we've seen, you know, kind of seen the pendulum swing back and forth and obviously now things like you know, other transaction authorities or uh, something, and I'll talk a little bit about commercial solution openings are in vogue. Um, uh, you know, and the, the, these things sort of c come and go, I think, right, over, uh, over time. So it's good to have a little bit of that longer, uh, that longer perspective uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of innovation and acquisition. So from a, from a GSA perspective, I'll tell you a couple things um, that we're doing that we think uh, are innovative. I mentioned commercial solution openings, which are a non-FAR-based procurement that we got authority to do a couple years ago in the, uh, in the NDAA. Uh, they're relatively small. Uh, they're, you know, they've got a $10 million limit on them. We've done, uh, we've done a number of them out of our assisted acquisition group. <laughs> Force has been a big customer for us, uh, and if you're familiar with AFWorks, we've done uh, done some things there. We we helped them uh, stand up a technology incubator, and they used a commercial solution opening to do that. We just did um, we just did one for AFWorks and um, uh, and Air Force Space Command, uh, where we helped them uh, stand up uh, a, a cloud environment, right, platform as a service, to um, to sort of test out some AI applications for the space domain. I was going to put the word blockchain in there also to hit all the buzzwords, but we didn't have anything to do with, uh, with blockchain. Uh, so there's CSOs, you know, probably something else I think it's worth mentioning on our schedules program. We have something called the Startup Springboard, which allows companies who don't have the traditional two years of corporate performance to gain access to the federal market through the schedules program. You can use 
the experience of uh, the owners of the company as substitute for corporate experience. You can use the owners of some of the key personnel that you bid on jobs as sort of past performance. Uh, and there's some alternate financial documentation you can submit also. We brought about 65 companies onto schedule uh, through, that, uh, through that program. Uh, Brycon is a great example, right? It's a, a, a image, geospatial imagery company um, that got into that program, quickly got some awards with SOCOM and NGA, and it's done about $10 million uh, in, uh, in business there. So I'd offer those two things as things that we're doing that are, um, that are innovative. I think it's important to mention that you know, in addition to kind of doing new things, we should be working on the existing system, right? So hopefully people don't feel like they've always got to do something different than a traditional FAR-based procurement. So we, you know, we, t we got, uh, announced the consolidation of the multiple award schedules program just a couple days ago, a big milestone for us. Purpose is to make it simpler for agencies to use and less burdensome for industry to provide solutions through there. Uh, so that, you know, that's a big milestone. We talked about the, um, we released an RFP for commercial platforms, so the, the Section 846 language in the National Defense Authorization Act. We're going to see that realized, hopefully streamline and simplify uh, buying for uh, below the micro purchase threshold. And then I guess the last thing I'd say uh, before I turn it, uh, turn it over to Chris is um, I think it's important when we're talking about some of these techniques to use them uh, for um, the reason which they're intended, right? And so, uh, you know, we, we were talking uh, over in the, in the room before we got out here about how some of these techniques are potentially not being used properly or being misused or maybe overused. Uh, and that, you know, the oversight community is not quick, um, but they are smart. Uh, and they will eventually come around and find the misuse of these things. Uh, and what generally happens is, uh, is we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And so what was a great idea, right? It gets misused, overused. I've said, I said to Diane, I can write the IG or the GAO report right now that'll come out in three years. And, and then it'll be verboten to do OTAs, for example, right? And that, that would be unfortunate uh, because they are a real tool in the toolbox. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Thanks, Alan. And thanks, Diane. And thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming today. And of course, uh, I follow with to the GMU team of uh, allowing us to come up here and speak on this panel. Um, so I think we're going to hear a lot about a number of topics, uh, obviously, with the, uh, the new approaches in federal contracting. But two that, that I like to key in on that are uh, very important in that but somewhat tangential are the fact, if, if you read through the prompt of what the panel is, um, there are a number of commercial companies out there that don't do business with the federal government and don't do it on purpose. And, you know, we're not necessarily the biggest buyer of, uh, of, of everything that's out there um, in, in a manner that we probably were you know, 20, 50 years ago. So, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, there are a number of companies out there that do not do uh, work with the government. So I think that, that's one key point. I'll, I'll come back to that. The second one is, you know, the, the name of the panel is New Approaches in Federal Contracting, and uh, Alan kind of alluded to it, but, you know, we're going to talk about contracting authorities to some extent, but none of those authorities are really new. So if we're talking about uh, OTs for prototype, OTs for basic applied advanced research, procurement for experimental purposes, uh, prize competitions. <clears throat> We've had those authorities for a number of years and they've come back into vogue. Um, and so we're, we're learning how to use them again uh, across the department and, and importantly to use them properly. Um, and, and they're fantastic tools for collaboration with industry. Uh, so I think that some of those tools force us to do that in a much better manner. Um, than we've done previously, although I think we can do that to some extent in the, the, the standard way of uh, procuring and then um, also allows us and forces us to some extent to op operate more on commercial terms, which is a, a very important point um, to back to that first point of the companies that don't want to work with us. Sometimes it's because they think that we're going to take their IP uh, and the like. So um, I think an important follow on to that is it's not just the contracting, it's, it's acquisition. What authorities do we have with acquisition? and our acquisition plans, and how did these particular vehicles that we're talking about integrate into um, how we procure, acquire uh, solutions for urgent needs? How do we use those within the middle tier acquisition authorities that we have? How do we use those vehicles within the greater acquisition of the more exquisite uh, and bigger programs? Um, and, and one of the things that's important also to the proper use of the authorities are the, the ones that I named, those are, those are for research, development, um, testing, prototyping. Uh, and so the, the next question, and it goes to the point of the planning, is how do we get that across, you know, Nick College, the, the value depth, 
across the chasm into, okay, we've developed a capability that is, is usable and we know that people want it and, it and it will help, you know, the people that are putting themselves in harm's way. How do we get it into the actual system to allow it to be fielded appropriately? I think that's a part that, uh, in general, we struggle with because uh, I can tell you from, from my organization, I'm sure that DARPA would say the same thing. We, we have incredible technologies that we're able to develop with industry, um, but it's getting it into our actual supply system and then into our actual fielding system because our, our appropriation laws are the same. Um, you know, the colors of money, the way they can be used are the same. Uh, so uh, those aspects haven't changed. So to jump back to the commercial companies, um, one of the challenges I think that we have also is how do we access those companies? So we have panels like this, and it's a great, uh, not just the panel, but the, the event that I, I assume most of the people within industry that are in the room right now probably are interested or do defense work on a regular basis. It's not the group of people um, who aren't necessarily interested in doing work with the government. So how do we reach those people? Um, I, I think there's several answers. I, I don't know the exact right answer, but I, uh, some thoughts are, um, one, we have to be involved in the things that they're involved in. So, you know, on, on the government side, we'll do industry days a lot. We'll, we'll send out RFIs on um, our standard, you know, FedBiz ops and the like. Um, but that's still going to the people that tend to do business with us, that, that know what a NAICS code is, that have registered in FBO for the NAICS code. And then the people that are coming to those events, the industry days and the like, are, are the people that are interested in doing business. So I think part of the answer to that is we need to be involved with industry. Kind of, you know, it's, it's probably a bit overused, but it's, it's appropriate, I think as a partner to what industry is doing and be part of those events. So, you know, top of mind are some of the top cyber events or top AIML events. We, we should be part, as the government, parts of those events where we're able to get into those, have access to those vendors, and then talk about our problems. So um, I think there's, there's two parts. You have, you have your engineer side who are very interested in interesting problems. Um, and I think in the government, we have a lot of interesting problems to deal with, and, and obviously you know, people in this room know it, but if you look at the things we're working on, um, you know, from, from space on down to subterranean and, and under the water, um, those are incredibly interesting engineering problems. So we have, to, we have to make sure we convey that in the right forms uh, for those people to come to us to want to work on those problems. And then also, we have to, we have to be able to work with industry in a manner that uh, I guess as my organization talks about, that has a good user experience for those vendors as well. So um, part of the reason some companies don't want to work with us is, uh, you know, there's the, the IP concern. People think that the government's going to go take our IP, so we're not going to have a commercial market after this. Um, and then also the, the revenue stream. Again, these are a lot of what we're talking about are R&D type vehicles. Um, and eventually we... we to use the phrase, we have to put our money where our mouth is. And if, if we're able to work with these companies uh, and then demonstrate that, yes, your technologies are interesting to us, we want to develop them and we want to field them as well, that obviously is going to generate a revenue stream. And, and it goes back to that you know, crossing the chasm. Um, and their backers, the venture capitalists, uh, investment bankers, you know, publicly traded companies, you name it, will start to see that. And, and particularly in the VC world, which is kind of where, where we, we're um, you know, strategically placed within Silicon Valley. Um, as the word spreads that, yes, there's actually revenue to be gained in this, and yes, the government can work with you, and they will not take your intellectual property. You will still have a, uh, a commercial market, which we, we want them to have a commercial mar market. We want them to thrive. We want them, we don't want to be the only customer necessarily for them. We want them to continue their own independent R&D and, and spread it and, and understand what's going on within the rest of the industry. But as we do that, I think, um, we will, frankly, we'll get a better reputation and, and get, more, uh, get more access to those types of companies. Well, thank you for inviting me to come talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to share with you just a little bit, because uh, that's all the time they gave me, about the work the Section 800 panel did. Uh, let's start with uh, why Section 800, pan uh, the 809 panel, I'm sorry, I keep on remembering the work done in the 90s by Al Berman, the only commissioner on our panel who also served on the 800 panel. Well, Senators McCain and Chairman Thornberry uh, looked around the world, saw what the threat was, looked inside the department, saw what our capabilities were, 
looked at the gap, and then looked at the acquisition system we used to close that gap. They weren't convinced that our acquisition system was up to the task of closing the gap between what our near-peer competitors have and what we have. That's why they asked the Section 809 panel be created, and that was the work that the Section 809 panel took on. When we very first met, there were some real uh, agreements that came right out, our very first meeting. By the way, there were 18 of us, uh, 16 when we finished. Uh, all of them, uh, save one, uh, had experience in both government and industry. Uh, many of the names of the commissioners on the panel you know uh, for, from dealings you've had with the department or with people in industry over your careers. But our very first agreement was all the work of the panel would be focused on delivering capability to the warfighter inside the turn of near-peer competitors and non-state actors. And what that really means, uh, the polite language aside, is we've got to beat the Russians and Chinese to putting in the hands of our operators technologies that exist in the marketplace that we don't have. Some of those can be provided by what we refer to as traditional contractors in the defense marketplace. But many of the new technologies that we need to give to our operators are in the other part of the marketplace. The days when some of us, many of you are much younger, but some of us grew up where there was a defense industrial marketplace, it did everything. All new technologies, for the most part, were developed there, and they were commercialized from that marketplace. Today, the reality of the global marketplace is DOD represents a very small portion of the R&D work done of the development of new technologies. In the process of focusing on coming up with recommendations to get this stuff to our warfighters quickly, we, we all agreed that the one thing the department does not value in the acquisition process is time. Now, now people talk about it in the department, and it's not because people in the department are bad, they're all good, they've done a really great job to date of out equipping our, our folks to do the job they're supposed to do, but the bottom line is they don't appreciate speed, and that was reinforced to us when we went out into the marketplace and we talked to companies all around the country, and, and many of them came to talk to us, and all of them decried the fact that it takes uh, really long times they use the 18 months to 24 months to do anything in the department and many of our programs as you know in fact our first group talked about uh, the F, uh, F15, F, F15, the F35, F35 has been in business for a while and they still haven't finished. Uh, I mean 20 years, 30 years and, and even on some of the things which you would think are simplest including services it can take 18 months to 24 months to go from the issuance of the initial RFP to the actual award and the uh, notice to proceed on the contract. And that's not how people in business do business. And for those companies who don't do business with the department on a regular basis or at all, that was the major barrier that they cited. And, and my colleague here talked about the venture capitalists. Well, we spoke to them too. And they said to us, to a company, to a man, to a woman, that they don't advise their new clients to seek out the Department of Defense in their business plans. Because they can't afford to wait more than six months to get a no on a proposal. It's just not the way the economy is structured. And so we looked at these things and we made 98 recommendations. Now, that doesn't reflect everything people talked to us about, everything we thought about, everything we thought needed to be fixed. 
It recommended the 98 recommendations that we could come to complete agreement on among ourselves and get done within the time limit Congress gave us. And, and even though we took two and a half years to do, issue our final report, uh, the 2,700 pages reflect the fact that we worked the whole time and we made a commitment in that process that not only would we identify a problem, not only would we talk about how that problem impacts the ability of warfighters to get capability, not only would we recommend how you might solve that problem, but we would actually provide you with the language you could use, whether you were the Secretary of Defense or Congress, to, to make the changes, which reflects the 2,700 pages in our report. And by the way, lest one of my former colleagues hurt me, uh, you can find all of this at <laughs> www.section809panel.org. Uh, again, that's www. I don't see you writing this down. <laughs> Write it down. It's important. <laughs> www.section809panel.org. Start with our roadmap. Uh, it takes the 98 recommendations. It puts them into some sort of order. And then online version will actually help you go from uh, the synopsis all the way to the actual language. So I guess at the very end of the day, what, what I would say is what Alan does at GSA, what DIUX is trying to do to OTAs. By the way, most of you are younger than OTAs, even though many of you think OTAs are new. You, I mean, you, you, you do remember that OTAs were the outcome of the Space Act, right, for NASA. That was the first OTA. And, and, and by the way, I, I share, uh, although we didn't talk about it a lot here, we will later, uh, let me warn you, uh, the abuse of OTAs that is occurring today, and when I say abuse, I mean people are using OTAs to avoid using the FAR. Uh, the abuse of OTAs is going to lead to an event where Congress is going to do what it normally does and take them away from you. One of the things the panel tried to do is recommend ways to improve the FAR so that you wouldn't want to use OTAs. And, and I just, one more side. I know I got to quit. No, it's fine. I know, I know, I know I got to quit. <laughs> I, I was at GSA for 10 years before I finished my federal career. I was their senior procurement executive, and I would regularly ask people, why are you using schedules or IDIQ contracts? And what would they tell me? Come on, you guys, can you participate. Protests. Uh, they, they, they used IDIQ contracts to avoid protests. They didn't care what the contract did. They just wanted to avoid the protests, so they used the IDIQs. And why do you use the schedules? Limited competition. Save time. They get protests on the schedules, but limited competition. Uh, the problem is every time we run into a difficulty with the current process, people look for a new process instead of fixing the existing process, valuing time and, and, and working on making sure that the key factor in all of this is the workforce is trained and capable and can make the far sing. Now I'll stop and we'll talk about more later because I was completely disjointed and I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. Thank you, okay. Steve. Sure. So it's my Marco Rubio moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll make three, uh, three quick points uh, that help you guys wake up. One, uh, as an actual VC and someone who's had OTAs going back to 2004, uh, I guess that makes me a, a unicorn, which now you can start undervaluing me um, <laughs> in the financial markets. A couple things I've seen. One, if, if we're talking about the objective or why we want to have new, new approaches to federal contracting, if you're a contractor, it's to get more money faster, right? Or to just get to your customer at the end of the day. The problem with that, number one, is I'm sure many of you, like I, have had contracting officers who literally have not read the FAR and are more following their existing organizational guidelines that the commander has, uh, he or she has knife handed them to do. Has anyone ever been the victim of that? Uh, 
I have also had OT users on the government side to mass effect say, I'm not really interested in non-traditionals. I just want to push more money to the primes, to the, to the major programs that I want to get done using OTs. So as someone who's had three consecutive OTs and has literally now walked out of that market and actually we're pivoting more towards uh, FedSim and Astro uh, as a solution, uh, I view that as ripe, as Dave was saying, for uh, general counsel rulings like there was one two years ago, if any of you were following that. And the reason why uh, I'm deeply concerned about this is if our objective is to get elite technology in the hands of the warfighter, right, which everyone supposedly supports, how can you watch the Chinese military parade? Was it yesterday or two days ago? Did anyone watch that? Incredible. Watch it right after you check section 809panel.org. Uh, it's .org, right? Section 809panel.org. Panel. Uh, um, watch that video. There's like an eight minute clip and then a three hour clip. And it's literally the Chinese parading uh, the fact that they produce four destroyers a month and we produce four destroyers a year. They take our, they acquire uh, our technology and no kidding, produce it faster than our original uh, concepts at one-tenth the cost. And they are building technologies aligned with their national military strategy. So the way it should go is you don't develop an army strategy and a national military strategy and then a national security strategy. You should, in theory at least, uh, build a national security strategy and then the good ideas flow down from there. Correct? Yes? Um, they are building a strategy and forces aligned with their strategy while we're floating $12 billion centers of gravity in the, Western, in the Western Pacific in the age of hypersonics. In my mind, that's why we need new approaches to federal contracting. So how do you do that? One, you understand that if you're a VC or any kind of private investor and you're a government R&D program manager, when you talk about investing in technology, even though we're all saying the same words, we're actually talking about two different things because the government, uh, the government's value pro proposition with their R&D funds is trying to answer one question is, does this work or does it not work, right? That's what government R&D goes to solve. A commercial investor, whoever it is, uh, or even a, a, a defense prime or a service provider who invests in technology is trying to answer a different question is, is there a buyer for this or is there not a buyer for this? Does that make sense? And the reason why that's important is there are different value propositions that you can't interpose. You can't take a commercial value proposition, hey, I want to open a, a new market for this water bottle, and go to a DARPA program manager and say, hey, will you give me a phase two so I can open up a new market for this? Say, so get out of here, man. I, I, I give you money to develop a specific uh, use case for this water bottle of which there, are, there is a global user base of maybe a thousand. <laughs> If you're a commercial, if, if you're like in John Hill on land, they will literally throw you out, throw you out of the building. Conversely, you don't go, uh, you don't go to a private investor or a government investor and say, "Hey, I'm interested in research prototypes. Will you give give me money for this?" They'll say, "No. All I want, all I care about is if you can open up and widen your access to the total addressable market." Right? You guys understand this? Um, so that's where the value is driven, and yet when we, we end up talking out of both sides of our mouth and wittingly in the government space because we don't understand that. So we talk about uh, we're going to be innovative and access commercial solutions and venture, 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 but then we, we're actually making, we're still making the government R&D argument to these commercial vendors. Now the commercial market can be, uh, the government market can be tremendously validating for commercial companies, and, and candidly, I've seen AppWorks do a very good job at this, uh, of providing a credentialized government customer, but that should not be the primary focus of these uh, commercial startups. Their commercial focus uh, is why they were created, i.e. 70% margin, not 20% or 8% or 6%. Otherwise, you don't get any money. Right? They'll say, look, you're a services company or you're a government contractor, not a commercial tech company. So we just have to be careful and cautious when uh, we, we leverage uh, superpowers like GSA and DIU as an example to achieve those effects. Lastly, uh, just a brief word on OTs. 
the existing consortium model, uh, which we've gone away from, we now just have a virtual network, uh, is an antithesis, antithesis in my mind to commercial non-traditional innovation. And for one basic reason, and literally, I, I, I kind of like the FAR, I don't even think we need to update the FAR, I think we just need to have contracting officers read the FAR and then have the commitment, and then, again, I get it, this is not everyone, but have the commitment to walk into their command and be like, sir ma'am, this is what your rule book says, I'm going to do this absent a GC ruling. So if you tell me that like when it says thou shalt you know, do this or do not do this, like having government contracting people say, even though I'm gonna, I have a $220,000 opportunity and I'm going to push it through a FAR Part 12, you know, full RFP, multiple Q&A, uh, instead of FAR Part 13, which I easily could do, like these are the types of things we can alleviate without adding additional content to the FAR. It's just getting them to read the damn document, to be candid. Um, the other thing, uh, and I'll end on this, is membership fees. These are basic, these are layups in my opinion. Like what's the saying, life's hard, but it's even harder if you're stupid. Um, why would you go to a non-traditional tech company? I mean, it, can be, it doesn't have to be a tech company in Silicon Valley. There's plenty of awesome tech right here, you know, in Loudoun, Fairfax County, Arlington County. You don't have to go to Austin and eat breakfast tacos with Army Futures Command to find compelling technology. But you sure as hell don't go to them and say, pay me $500. I mean, see how cheap this sounds? $500 or, or $2,500 for the honor of, by the way, you get nothing for that. You, all you have is the honor of seeing federal contracts from the Air Force or the Army. And then you get to bid on it. Oh, and then by the way, the consortium management firm, even if it was us, then you're, you're jammed into working with us as a, as a consortium manager, right? And then, by the way, now you know, that's going to be an additional 10% or 18% or 32% you know, pay up. So th these are the, the fundamental brass tacks. Like, so there are, was challenges that I see. And, and what's encouraging to me is these are relatively easy to fix. You don't need an, another amendment to the Constitution uh, known as the NDA to, to fix this stuff. But you just got to be aware of it. And, you, and, and for God's sakes, just try to think it through. Um, before we do more damage. Okay, so just a little bit of background about me for those of you who are not aware of, of who I am and what I've done. I've worked OT since 1994. I started my career actually on the Section 800 panel on the task force, so I hate to admit that, uh, how old that is. Uh, and then spent a lot of my career. <laughs> that's right, I was still in junior high. Uh, and then spent a lot of my career at DARPA and in fact worked on the first OT for prototype that was ever done by DOD. So I've watched the evolution of OTs and that's not what the focus of this panel is but that is sort of the hot topic of the day. Um, ironically, I find it funny now, we used to have to make people do OTs back in the 90s and now I'm beating people off with a stick who are doing them and shouldn't be doing them. So it's funny how the pendulum swings both ways. Um, but to Stephen's point, I think it's a very good point. I, even though I love OTs, they're not right for everything. They are not the be all end all. They are not a substitute for the FAR. And the FAR has its uses and its places. And one of the biggest issues I see right now is people don't read the FAR anymore they are so bogged down with internal processes and procedures that have been built around the FAR, they don't realize how flexible it can be and actually be able to use its terms and conditions the way it was intended. So I'm hoping what comes out of all of this acquisition reform movement, this third one that we're experiencing right now, is we take a hard look at how we do FAR-based acquisitions and find out what's the real problem. Is it the FAR? Is it Congress? As much as they're a problem, I don't think so. Um, or is it just what we do to ourselves which ironically is the easiest thing to fix because we have total control over that and can do that. So looking to the panel members, what do you think is the single biggest near-term issue, either positive things that you want to implement or negative things that you want to try to fix, uh, and near-term meaning the next one to three years, let's say, um, and what do you think you need to do or the government should do to fix that? And I'll just start with Alan. Sure. So. I mean, I'll give you a GSA perspective. I mentioned schedules consolidation, which for us is important, right? It's, a, it's about a $15 billion a year program. Um, it really is designed, if you're an operational contracting officer, to make your life much simpler and easier. Uh, uh, and so, you know, we, we thought <laughs> the program's 40 uh, years old or so, uh, and then it was time, really their time for a refresh. 
Um, the sales on the program have been flat uh, for the last several years, and we think part of the reason is that it became a little bit um, a little bit burdensome from an industry standpoint, and sometimes hard for customers to sort of figure out how to piece together solutions. Right. So when the schedules were first created, you know, the, and it was primarily product-driven uh, sales initially, right? And then um, I don't know, probably eight, ten years ago, it sort of flipped, and services became um, you know, became the, the big driver on schedules. But you know, you'd have people come and say, "Well, hey, I want to acquire, uh, say, a contact center, right?" And so, what schedule do I go to to do that, right? Do I go to the professional services schedule, or do I go to the IT IT schedule, Schedule 70? Uh, and if I'm a company and I want to put together a solution that it involves people and technology, do I have to do I have to like team with myself across the uh, across the schedule? Um, so, from our standpoint, you know, we thought that was um, a pretty logical place to start. From a GSA perspective, it's something we control, we can impact that has, you know, that has broad applicability across the government. It really does make the, um, the line level CO's job um, a, a little bit easier. You know, we finished the first phase of that uh, just a couple of days ago by announcing, uh, releasing the single solicitation. Um, we'll do a mass modification to bring everybody over. Uh, we should have that done about halfway through this year. Uh, and then for some special cases, we'll sort of clean that, uh, clean that up. So that's something that we can you know, that we can really declare victory on and say we think it's made it easier for agencies to buy the solutions they want and simpler for industry to sell those solutions uh, to our customers. And again, it's something in our, uh, in our control. I mean, I, I have all kinds of wild ideas, right? But I'll I get to those in a minute. I can't, I can't <laughs> implement those, right? But at GSA, that, that, you know, that, that, that's something that I, can, uh, that, I, that I can't impact. Great. Chris? Um, I, actually, if you don't mind, before I jump into that, just uh, Point of clarification on OT. So I think, so the 2371B authority, OTs for prototype, um, we, we talk about those broadly, and I think oftentimes we lump consortium into being synonymous with OT, um, and, and they are not. They're, they're different things. There are standalone OTs. There are consortium OTs. They're, they're separate and, and distinct. Um, so the, the standalones, you compete a specific problem set, or you compete it however you want, but um, it, it's a a discrete solution to a problem that comes out and that's competed and it's, it's full government process uh, in doing that versus potentially a consortium, which I think Stephen was, was specifically referring to. So I just wanna make that point because I, I, I talk to a lot of people across the Department of Defense and those tend to get um, kind of melded together into one and they're not. So um, <clears throat> just wanted to make that point. Uh, so the, the next part to the, the near term changes, I guess, the major one that I don't know if we can really affect in, in this room is, uh, to some extent, the, the, the way that we appropriate money. I know that's a, a huge, uh, uh, huge and loaded statement to make, but um, again, just I'm thinking about our transition challenge that we have going from demonstrated capability into actually fielding that capability. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the way that we, we set up our colors of money and the way that we set up the, the, the years of usage of that money um, could, could potentially affect that. But it doesn't go away from the fact that we need to plan that internally as well. We need to plan for those transitions um, regardless of, of that. So that's one. And I guess the other one that we can affect, and I know within our organization we try, we, we make a concerted effort to do this, and I'm seeing it across the DOD more, um, is the, the policy that Diane referred to, because I, I don't think anybody disagrees that the, the FAR and, and its supplements give us, um, give contracting officers leeway to make decisions. Um, and then you have internal policy that sometimes takes away some of that leeway. Uh, and, and in our, our training, we, we are trained to, uh, I think, more so comply than more so to think and use our judgment on the best way to go about these acquisitions. So I, I think those are the near-term things that we we can change, and specifically, and it's a federal conversation, and it's true, but I'm thinking just within Department of Defense, we can, we can affect those, and I think that would be the, the, the quickest near-term change we can make, is reduce that policy. Okay. Four things that we can do in the next two. Oh, go, go In the next two days, they can do two of them. <laughs> First, they can issue guidance within the Department of Defense, across the civilian agencies as well, that you will not use FAR Part 15 source selection procedures 
for purchasing commercial items up to the commercial threshold of $7 million without getting permission from someone at the Secretary of Defense level. <laughs> it, it will change behavior, and they can do it overnight. Second, they will issue guidance, they could issue guidance tomorrow that says that you will not use FAR Part 15 source selection procedures for issuing task or delivery orders against IDIQ contracts or the schedules contracts without getting the Secretary of Defense's approval. Change behavior overnight, make a huge difference not only to government with, the, with which the speed they issue these things, but to industry in terms of the speed with which they can reply to those things. Third, the department has complained that it takes a lot of time to hire people. They've got about 40, I don't have the exact number anymore memorized, but it's around 40 uh, authorities that Congress has given them over time that they asked for, and they spend loads of time when they try to hire somebody figuring out which authority has to be used in the process to use it. They could shrink it down to seven. They could do it themselves. They don't need Congress's permission. That might take three days. Fourth, this would take about a year. The current commercial clauses in FAR Part 12 are about 157, 174, 174. I'm getting old numbers. It's around that number. They were originally 54. Congress, since it created commercial items in 1994 in FASA, had only 54, 55 required clauses. All of the additional clauses, that 100 plus clauses that have been added, were added by either the department or by OMB, not without congressional direction. Now, the reason that'll take about a year is because they got to issue a FAR case that says, we're going to remove all those clauses and go back to at least the original 54, 55 required by statute. Four things. They could do the three, of the three of those things within a week. The fourth thing within a year would make a huge difference on how we do business. Won't solve the non-traditional problems, although it might reduce some of the barriers to non-traditionals who might be interested in doing commercial contracting with the department. Okay. By the way, you can read those in our report <laughs> at <laughs> www.section809panel.org. Okay. <laughs> Steve. I gave a couple of recommendations already, uh, so I'll just give two others. Uh, one, uh, Eric Lofgren's, uh, I hate calling these things blogs when they actually have quality content in them. That's almost a disservice. Uh, but Acquisition Talks, or talk, acquisition, acquisitiontalk.com. Uh, go there. The content he has on his blog is better than 99% of the stuff out there. And he's just some random dude, no offense. Uh, <clears throat> but great job, I uh, like what you're doing. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, in the consortium management agreements, uh, government customers interested in using OTs, if they're going to use a consortium manager, should eliminate membership fees as a source of revenue. Uh, in other words, like put on your commercial hat and figure out another way to make uh, your damn money. Um, so that's. Uh, Recommendation two. Uh, an addendum to that, uh, I'm actually a huge fan um, of government run OTs. I think Cornerstone, uh, if any of you are on that or familiar with that, is actually a cautionary tale, not of, uh, I think, of what to do, but also shows the reason why the government originally went to a consortium managers. And that was the point of you getting revenue for squatting on that OT. It's not for you to get revenue, it's for you to provide value added services. Things like outreach. The government, no matter how sexy or she she they, they are, or how many cool logos or challenge coins they have, generally is not good at outreach. Um, to Chris's point earlier, they also, the commercial world generally knows uh, that the government is a customer and could be an attractive customer, they just choose not to work with you for a number of reasons we've already talked about. So, what do you do about that? This is why you have a consortium manager to actually do real outreach. So when I, uh, if you're any of you, after a series of poor life choices, are uh, dumb enough like I was to start your own company, um, what 
uh, originally I said, hey, in 2014, what we need, we need to get the top four US accelerators, Techstars, 500 Startups, Stanford StartX, and Y Combinator. And we went out formal relationships with all the major, uh, in my mind, in terms of internal rate of return, major venture capital firms in the country. Crap, how do I do that? How do I get them to do that for free? Um, and what I realized, you actually could, can't get them to do that for free. Just don't give them a crappy value proposition, and that is don't waste their time. Because time, in, in most people's mind, at the end of the day, is uh, infinitely more valuable than money. So they work, they work with us for free. Very nice. Uh, so the breakdown is when you have uh, either government customers who are like, I'm just, you know, we're, we're not getting it done and I'm just going to do everything in house. And then they suck at outreach. And so basically, the Cornerstone OT emails get blasted to guess who? The defense industrial base, not the point of that OT. Um, or the inverse is you have a consortium manager that then charges the non traditionals for the honor of seeing. Uh, opportunities in the federal government. I would argue both are wrong, um, and it's an easy fix by eliminating that um, uh, membership agreement. Can I just make one, uh, one quick sort of add-on to something that Chris said. I think you talked a little bit about funding, how we, how we appropriate money. Um, most people in this room probably know about working capital funds or, re or revolving funds in the government, right? It, um, we have a big one at GSA that I run called the Acquisition Services Fund. I was on this board that Congress created called TMF, the Technology Modernization Fund, which is also a, a working capital fund. It's actually surprising how many people in government in the agencies don't actually ha have the authority to do those sort of things, but don't, don't leverage uh, the working capital fund concept to the, full, to the full extent. It's particularly important in technology. It helps you sort of get out of that every year cycle or that, uh, that O&M trap. Uh, and I, I almost feel like in my spare time, like putting together a, a working capital fund education course, because I do think it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an existing authority that people in the government already have, and almost every agency has some sort of working capital fund, and it just doesn't feel like it's being leveraged uh, properly. And it, it, industry has a stake in that, obviously, because I think it can give, you, it can give folks in industry um, a little more steadiness uh, in terms of how programs are funded. Uh, and potentially allow you to take a little bit more risk. But it just for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like there are enough people in government who know how to pull those levers or, or are aggressive enough about pulling, uh, pulling those levers. So I just when you mentioned funding, that, that triggered that in my mind. Well, and to the funding point, you know, we oftentimes like to say that we have issues because Congress doesn't get money to us quickly enough or constrains how we can use the money. When you study appropriations law, though, you realize most of the restrictions that we feel internally were created by ourselves. There are the allotments and the allocations that we have done to ourselves over the years that Congress actually gives us a relative amount of flexibility in how we spend our money. Um, and that is something that, again, we can address because that is not something we need congressional approval for or even regulatory approval, but instead, and maybe we need to loosen up some of those restraints. Chris and I were talking uh, beforehand, you know, is it really necessary to split up R&D into seven different categories and then have all kinds of consternation about whether or not you can use 6.3 for prototypes, which some argue you can't, where we've been doing it f at DARPA for 30 some years um, with nobody complaining about it. So do we need to have a little bit more flexibility and freedom and be able to use our own good business sense and our own good sense of protecting the taxpayer dollars? And I think most of the folks in the government are capable of that. We've just gotten over-regulated and over-constrained. And to that point, one question I did want to have, and this is one that I hesitate to bring up a little bit because some might get offended, so please don't. You know, have we trained critical thinking out of our acquisition workforce? Have we gotten to the point where everyone is so compliance-driven and so regulatorily driven and so rule-driven that people don't know how to think anymore? And I see that in the OT world a lot. Because OTs have fought for, you know, as, as Dave says, they've been around for 60 years, they've been around for over 30 years in DOD. Through that time, those of us who have been doing OTs, we have fought tooth and nail to make sure there are no regulations and that the guidance is kept to the minimal amount possible because we want people to have the flexibility to think and come up with good ideas. But as more and more people are using them, that's the one thing I get all the time. Can you send me a checklist? Can you send me a sample or a model or form, worse, um, there's, how do I know what I'm supposed to do 
we, it's almost like we've trained out people's ability in many ways to think for themselves and use their own internal good business sense. And I have learned over the years, too, there are some people who have no good business sense and so probably should not be using some of these things. But I think the vast majority of folks within DOD and within the, the government at large do. It's just that we've not been allowed to use it for too long. And so to the panelists, would you agree or disagree? Is this something we need to back off of? Is having so many rules and so much compliance driven, even within the FAR-based system, or is there still a danger and still a concern that we need all that? Uh, so I, I can start. I, I would say I generally agree. Um, I think you know several panelists, Dave, Dave made the point, Steve made the point, there's a lot of flexibility in the FAR. Um, for me, it's a leadership issue, right? You gotta have line level people comfortable that, the, mm -hmm. that you've got their back. Uh, if they're going to go off and use some of that flexibility that, that exists in these, uh, in these regulations. I, mean, I mentioned the oversight community in my opening remarks. They perform a valuable function. Uh, they're part of what we do. I wouldn't want to live in a country that didn't have an active oversight community like we do. Uh, but you've got to give you know, line level people um, the, the, uh, the sense that you will, you will back them up if they, if they take, some, uh, take some risks, right? And I think too often uh, you know, sort of the average uh, person in the government sort of thinks, you know, I start the year with a score of 100, and I just don't want to do things to get points taken off of my score, oh. right, sort of over the course of the year. And you know, we ideally like the kind of other mentality, which is, hey, you start the, you start the uh, year with a clean sheet, oh. right, and you're trying to do things over the course of the year to add points to your sheet, maybe to get uh, to get to 100. But, you know, I think um, again, I think, it's a, I think it's a leadership issue. You've got to get people motivated and comfortable that you're going to back them up if they, uh, if they take risks. Uh, concur with all of that. Um, I, I, I do think there's, so we have our you know, institutional level education, then you of course have your, your organizational education as well. And um, obviously there, there are rules and laws that we have to follow. Um, and you know, the point was made that you know, China stealing our IP. I don't think that's a, a question as to whether that's happening or not, and we have to have the appropriate um, checks within our, our contracts to ensure that our vendors are, are protecting their information appropriately. But um, I, yeah, I think I think in general on the institutional level, we, we do need to look a little better at um, training our contracting officers and training our project managers. Um, on you know appropriate business judgment, um, in, the rules are important, obviously as well. But um, I think moving towards the judgment allows you to uh, pick and choose which rules. Uh, you know the ones that are required, obviously you, you do that. But the ones that are good ideas or should be used in certain cases, because the things that we acquire are, are very different, and a lot of them are case by case basis. So having that appropriate level of judgment is uh, essential. Um, and then the, the leadership and personnel issue is it's a given in in everything, and I think, um, perhaps to go a little bit off that, that question, but you know, when we talk to, to senior leaders, and you know, we're having them talk today, and you, you see, uh, you, you, know, you understand their intent, you hear them speak a lot, um, they are saying, I want you to take risk, I want you to use your best judgment, and I want you to execute, and I'm gonna provide that top cover. Um, and I think we, and this is probably across every organization. This is not a government specific thing. It's an industry as well. Um, need to push our, our middle level uh, management harder to enforce that and to buy into that as well. Because you know the, the top level can say it all day long, um, and, and you know you'd like to think that everybody will comply. But oftentimes, I think what we're seeing is you, you get down to that lower level, and, and OTs are the example of um, I want you to do OTs. I want you to use them appropriately, but I want you to think broadly on how you can execute these, how you can compete them, how you can um, come up with business arrangements that are perhaps a little more unique than what you've done in the past. And I think what we find is a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. Um, you'll find the contracting officers that are they're rearing to go, but the, the next level up or next one or two levels up are, are less rearing to go on it and perhaps hinder some of that. So um, it's an education piece and it's, it's with many other things, it's, it's a leadership piece as well. I think that's, uh, that's a challenge. Well, just to jump in on that, in, in teaching for the last two years at the working level, which is where I was focusing uh, people actually how to do OTs and how to actually accomplish them, almost every organization I go to say, we're all ready to go, but I can't get my immediate leadership to agree. They're afraid of 
getting oversight, they're afraid of causing too much notice for them, you know, there's a lot of fear associated with trying something new and different. And it's great to think that we can educate people and that we can push it down, but I'll tell you from experience in the first go-round of OTs in the 90s, the thing that got people off the dime was forcing them off the dime. <laughs> don't give them a choice. And leadership at the highest levels may need to start to do that with some of these new and innovative tools is, I realize you're scared and I realize this may be uncomfortable for you and it may be a cultural change, but guess what? Get off the dime and try it. And what most people find, in my experience, is they try it once, they realize they're not gonna die or go to jail or get fired, which nobody's gotten gone to jail for OTs yet, so feel comfortable. And then the next few times they try it, it's much more comfortable, they have a lot less drama, a lot less worry and that's how you sometimes need to effectuate change and some people just aren't good at change and that's not something DOD is good at in general and I assume the other agencies are as well and sometimes you just have to be forced to do it and that may be the point we get to is asking for volunteers is great but sometimes we've got to push people off the ledge a little bit and so I'll let the other gentlemen chime in on anything else they'd like to add. <laughs> Uh, you find somebody who knows how to make the FAR sing or the DOD 5000 series sing. They can do anything. You don't need to change a rule. You just need to let them go. Get, give them the money they need and let them go. They'll get it done. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a big choir of folks that can make the FAR sing or the 5000 series thing, sing. One observation. Second, our market is not monolithic. In the DOD specific marketplace, where people are developing stuff that's not developed anywhere else, we're giving them, we're reimbursing their costs, we need a different set of rules than we need for the market segments that, <coughs> where we're buying what they, what they sell to everybody else. And what we need to do is improve the efficiency of the rules in the market segment, which ought to be uh, what it is today, but but better, and get rid of the rules that are different from and make it harder for us to do business with the people who do business with each other every day. We need to recognize that businessmen, buyers and sellers, don't have CAS uh, and, and don't need CAS because of the relationship they have. They don't need a contract which, when you print out all the clauses, including the ones that are incorporated by reference, totals 1,300, 1,700, 2,000 pages of material, and none of which is particularly clear, most of which requires you hire lawyers, I recommend you hire lawyers, uh, to advise you on, on what it is you're actually signing. We, we haven't done that yet, and one of the recommendations we've made in the panel is to recognize the difference between those parts of the market, mm -hmm. to change the way we do business so it comports with the way businessmen do businesses, do business in the part of the market where we're buying what they buy and sell every day, and improve that part of the, the, those rules which apply to the market where we're buying unique. Uh, right now, we treat it as a one-size-fits-all, and, and, and that makes it harder for us to beat the Russian and Chinese to get the neat stuff, to put it in the hands of the operators so they can figure out how to use it where, before the Russians and the Chinese use it against us. Okay. Yeah, anything to uh, I'm going to give a shout out to, to the Lord Jerry and George Mason are doing, uh, not because Jerry and I have been good friends for a long time, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> in all truth, uh, I was thinking about this last night as I was drinking one of uh, John's fantastic uh, cocktails. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it dawned on me that, um, I mean, look, I, I started my career uh, in 2001, uh, was a consultant, and then inside the government uh, with, the, uh, with the IC and then DOD, then ran a venture back to AI startup uh, before AI was cool again. And then I uh, worked at a mid-sized defense corporation before starting my own business. So that was my kind of career arc or more of a sine wave uh, when I think about it. Um, and, you know, having spent a lot of time in the business development space, we, I feel on the contracting side, there's almost this, uh, you call it like the supremacy of the BD guy, right? I'm going to hire this BD guy or this BD gal and they're going to freaking BD their way into <laughs> fix the, you know, the, you know, and figure out this freaking agency and they're going to push, cram as much of whatever the hell our company does or makes down the throat of that agency and then you're going to find the contracting uh, vehicles as a way to like leverage that. In many ways, what, what uh, 
Jerry's organization is doing, no kidding, is I would hope realigning that value proposition where you have the supremacy of knowing what, how the hell the government operates and works. Yeah, you know a guy and I've got 5,000 LinkedIn connections and all, all that jazz, but like, do you understand and can you help educate your government customer on how you can really do things first and then do the old buddy, old pal, let's go you know, smoke cigars and, and, and talk business. So I'm not denigrating that, but right now I feel like it's like 90% that, the you know, uh, muckety muck, and then it's 10%, oh, how do we actually get it on contract again? Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I, I've been in with all the way up to the top primes where that plays itself out. That doesn't make my, I don't view myself or any of those other people I have those conversations with as like being wrong, but there's so little focus on this, what we're talking about here, that that's a, that's a problem. Now why is that a problem and why the hell do, should we do anything about it? Um, up until now, we have had the luxury of, of taking our time, right? You know, the sad adage, oh, our force is like designed or conceived in the 70s, tested in the 80s, and fielded in the 90s, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's a problem. Right? Someone should do something about it. Well, hey, no kidding. We should really do something about that now <laughs> um, for the, my, the remarks I mentioned earlier because we don't have time anymore. We can't take our time figuring things out in the dark. So in the past, we've done things typically because we've had to, but let me just briefly in 15 seconds remind you of the actual American way of war because I'm old enough to remember when we were losing 1,000 people a month uh, wounded and 100 people a month dead in Iraq. So we treated us like, oh, we're, we just 100% figure things out, you know, everything for the war fighter. Well, you know, I remember when things were like no bueno and, and you had people in D.C. openly made senior politicians declaring the war lost. Uh, so to throw some cold water on you. Uh, you know, Battle of Lexington, War of 1812, most of the, the first two and a half years of the Civil War, all of 1917, you know, 1941 through 1943, you know, Vietnam, I mean, the, the typical, the actual American way of war involves, you know, a, about 20 to 30 percent of all of us dying initially and then the, and being buried in graveyards overseas and then the rest of us coming home for the, the cheery GI parade down uh, Fifth Avenue in New York City. So we need to be very, very careful in terms of being intellectually arrogant about us, our ability to figure things out. Because historically, we figure things out, but only at great, great cost. So my motivation for doing this and having me move back from Manhattan is to figure shit out. And, and what Jerry is doing right now with George Mason and focusing on sweating the details, that's, uh, and, and the fact that you guys are here for this, this is what matters to me, um, much more so than, because uh, candidly, my, it kills me when we talk about culture change. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. You know, I stop calling them lessons learned and start call, calling them lessons encountered, because we keep encountering these lessons again and again. <laughs> and what I would hope is that sweating the details, uh, knowing how the FAR operates, helping, like, uh, it used to be called TARDEC, now Ground Vehicle Combat, uh, Ground Vehicle Service Center, right, GVSC. Uh, the Futures Roadshow, have you guys, you guys know Ben McMartin? And they, these, so these are government guys and gals that have this roadshow, and they're kind of like junkies. They pass out like buttons with their faces on it, and they go around to government offices and, and educate them. So these are people learning by doing, educating them on how do you do your job, how can you use the FAR, how have we up in Detroit, Michigan, used the FAR and OTs and other things? So I think more of that and, and more of what Jerry's doing uh, are, are absolutely what we need. Diane, I'm sorry, I need to jump okay. in again here. Uh, you, you made a really important point, and I'm not sure everybody in the audience understands that. We are at war. Now, now many of you are used to the kinetic war we've been fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we are at war at many other levels. Some days it's awful close as to whether we're winning. We have got to avoid the situation of this being December 6th, 1941. We, we have got to put our acquisition system on a war footing so that we have the opportunity to deter 
events which will cause you literally to wake up in the dark. And we're not doing it. It is, it's, it's important. It's real. You know, I, 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 I can't give you a classified threat briefing. Many of you haven't had one. If you had one, though, you'd, be, you'd go home and be worried. And we, we react in the acquisition side of the system because we've been so successful over time that we can deal with it. I'm not sure that will be the case tomorrow morning. We can't wait. We've got to put our acquisition system both on industry side and on government side on a war footing and take this seriously, or our dominance is really at risk. And that's what we learned over three years of taking information from folks, both in government and industry, from talking to some of our near-peer competitors, from talking to other countries who are beating us to the finish line uh, while we're just taking our time. Uh, I'll stop no. now because no. I'll get up to the American flag away. <laughs> this is serious stuff. I, I, I won't. It, it's serious stuff. I'll maybe just jump in on uh, something that Dave uh, said there. You know, I think um, it is serious, right? And sometimes we try and sort of you know scare people. Hey, if you saw the brief, right, that I saw, you, you'd be scared. I think it's also important, particularly you know we're talking about trying to get drive innovation in the system. We're trying to get new kinds of companies access into this market. We should have a conversation about values, right? What's at stake, right? Why is what we're doing, why is what the Department of Defense is doing, all the other departments in the government, right? Why is that important? What kind of values are we defending uh, as a way to attract people who may not initially be attracted to that mission, right? And they sort of, hey, they're not the kind of folks who might get up in the morning and say, this, the being scared is going to motivate me, right? But they might be the kind of folks who say, you know what? I want to live in a country that has a bill of rights, right? And, and, uh, and sort of respects the rule of law like we do here. That values conversation, I think we're sometimes a little shy about, about having it. But I do think it's something that can motivate particularly a lot of younger people who are drawn to technical fields who, who may not, you know, they, they don't have anybody in their family who was in the military, right? They, they, they don't, they just sort of, you know, the Pentagon for them is just something that they occasionally see like on the internet uh, or, or, you know, maybe on a news program or something like that. Uh, the, the values conversation I think can be important in drawing the right kind of people uh, into um, the kind of work we're doing and then getting them motivated to be, to be part of the mission. The non-traditional companies we talk to are patriotic. They are. All of them talked about their interests, and in the, several of them we talked to had just been visited by Chinese delegations who were trying to buy them. They didn't want to sell to the Chinese. But they don't know how to do business with the, with the government, with DOD in specific. And they're not going to do business with the government at the expense of their business. Just one last comment, and then we'll go to the questions uh, that I'd just like to throw out there. Um, Heard a lot of talk, and I say it often, about we need to speed up the process. We need things to go much more quickly. What I'm seeing, though, in a lot of organizations is speed is becoming, the, they're becoming hyper fixated on speed to the extent of ignoring everything else. And I think that's a bad position to get to also. We have to be good business people. We have to use the taxpayer dollars wisely. Yes, I'm all for moving along the process. I think it's too slow. I think that there's a lot of efficiency that we could recognize. but. I don't think we can sacrifice everything else for speed. We still have to make good decisions, and we still have to do good planning, and there has to be a balance there. And we tend to swing very widely one way or the other without landing in the middle, and I think that's something we need to strive for more. And when I get calls from people about wanting to do OTs and I ask them why they want to do them, the number one answer I get is because I want to do it fast, which is not the point of doing OTs in the first place. Um, and they don't really understand that, but that's what everybody's looking for. And fast is great, but fast and stupid is not going to do us any good. And it's going to only hinder us later on, so we need to find that nice balance and middle ground. Okay, so to the questions, and then we'll let you go to the break. I realize we are standing between you and the break. <laughs> so the first question was, how are the federal civilian agencies implementing OTs, CSOs, and other alternative acquisition methods 
Are there examples of civilian agencies that are doing this well that you can cite? And I think you spoke to CSOs already. CSOs, yeah. I would say for us, DOD has been the big customer. DHS has the authority. I know mm -hmm. Soraya is going to be here later today, I think. That would actually be a good, yeah. a good question to hold uh, for her and get some sense for how, how DHS might be, might be utilized. And they have not uh, through, through GSA, or we haven't seen a big groundswell from the civilian side through, through the authority that GSA has. Our work's been with, uh, with DOD there. I mean, I personally can tell you who, which agencies have authority to do OTs or OT-like um, authorities. Obviously, NASA is the biggest and the oldest. They do the most, and, but they don't really, they're not OTs per se like we think of them. They have the Space Act Authority. Um, but they do it very differently uh, than DOD does. There are some agencies that have it specifically because of the markets they have to play in, and NIH and HHS come to mind because they deal with pharmaceutical companies. You want to talk to a group of people that want to have nothing to do with us? Talk to the pharmaceutical companies. They have more money than God, and they don't, they're not going to bend to what we want to do. And so they've had to come up with alternative methodologies to do business with these folks. Likewise, FAA. FAA got exempted from the FAR 20-some years ago, specifically because they dealt with airlines and airports who don't want to have anything to do with the FAR. They don't understand it. They don't care. And then there's a few other agencies that have it for unique things. DHS got it in their originating legislation and have it back again, thank goodness, um, and been doing, trying to do some different things with it. So there are some agencies out there utilizing it, but oftentimes it's because they have very specific missions and very specific issues. DOD is a little more like NASA in that we have this overarching use of it, that we're using it for a bunch of different things. Anybody else have anything to add to the question? Oh. The, the lead for most other agencies getting OTs done in the military. If, so if you don't know that, traditionally it was ACC, New Jersey, Army Contracting Command, New Jersey, up at Picatinny. Um, so they're, uh, the, you know, people who, mm -hmm. also to the CSOs. Yeah. Um, those, and then the other one that I would encourage you to look at are technology investment agreements, TIAs, mm -hmm. they're lesser known, um, but TIAs allow you to, I guess have reprogram reprogrammable like uh, authority, um, whereas OTs, uh, which I love that you said, are, are specifically for research prototypes using RDT and E dollars, right? So the superpower, the superpower I want is being able to take any money and use it towards research prototypes. Okay. Um, does the panel foresee the con resolving the conflict between a drive for faster and more commercial like buying with the government's unique requirements around IT supply chain security and I would posit other government unique issues uh, which represent a high hurdle to commercial sales opportunities? Mm -hmm. the, the, there is a real threat which DOD has led the way in addressing in terms of cyber. Uh, and they actually started really uh, back with the counterfeit products um, uh, changes to the DFARS. And when you think about it, really, the cyber issues uh, really fit, fold well into that. But um, here's the problem. Uh, we have a one-size-fits-all solution, again, being layered against this issue. Uh, buying should be strategic. There are some things that, that we're going to buy that are never, ever going to get into sensitive systems or be connected to system systems or being, being able to even be connected to sensitive systems. And those things don't need to be cyber compliant. There are also other issues. The, the, the sabotage that is directed against the government generally and DOD specifically is in part sabotaged by the way we buy. We telegraph to the world when we're going to buy something. We telegraph to the world who's going to be in the competition to buy, for, buy those things, and we allow the, the, the people who want to sabotage those systems to go find it. Maybe we need to change the way in which we do some of that buying. You know, buying in the blind, which can still be satisfy competition, can still have integrity, and can still be, uh, be compliant, uh, those things aren't being explored. Instead, we have this one size uh, application being layered over the whole process. And yes, that's going to make it harder to buy from, particularly a company who has got a very unsophisticated IT system but has a really sophisticated solution we'd like to have. Anyone else like to chime? 
Okay. So um, we're running against our time. Uh, several questions came in that were very specific to GSA, and I would ask that the people that had those questions grab you at the break. Oh, you're so kind, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there you are. Um, but I'd just like to wrap up with one final question for the group, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and break, and that is, if you got to be king for a day and be in charge of the government, what, what's the one thing that you would like to change in federal contracting to make the whole process easier? Would it be appropriations? Would it be competition? Would it be you know, process-driven? Would you dump the FAR? What would you do that you think would be revolutionary and different? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I would actually take, uh, I don't think I'd take anything in the acquisition system, right? I would look uh, to the personnel system, right? And I'd, mm. uh, you know, just make it much, um, I'd like to make it much easier for people to come in and out of government, right? Change a little bit of maybe, ha and so again, this is king-like king powers, Absolutely. right? Sovereign powers. Uh, change the way we reward people. Uh, so you bring in different kind of people. You maybe have them move in and out, right? I think folks who have been in industry and been in government um, are, are both more effective in their, in their roles and they've got those two perspectives. Uh, and then, you know, the way, we, the way we compensate and measure people is still a little bit constrained in the government, kind of doesn't match what's happening out in the private sector. And I think that does, uh, to some extent, that does limit the kind of people that, uh, that come into the government and, um, uh, and stay. So I would actually look to the, to the people side of it. Agree. I've, I've said this uh, for a while. As we talk about acquisition reform all the time, um, and I, I still think it goes back to the, the people. It's, it, are we are we bringing on the right people appropriately, and, and are we able to allow them to move on um, when it's time to do that? And as leaders, are we incentivizing our workforces appropriately, and do we have the the full authorities to do to do that? Um, so. Uh, I think that's absolutely um, one of the most important things. But to the other part of something I think we can affect is um, it goes back. It's still the policy. It's, it's the leadership and policy. So if, if, if you know our king for a day type deal, um, you know I, I would force our so dropping down from secretary level and, and four star level, dropping down to you know between the the two star and the the O six or you know SES and uh, GS15 and H4 level, um, challenge them to take some risk. And because we, we, so we've talked about all the authorities that we have, and we have the ability, I think, to do the things that we want to do with, within the far world, without the far world. Um, and it's just a matter of the, the leadership and the personnel appetite to execute that. Um, so the things that we can do on that are potentially reduce some policy or, or the, the extraneous policy that we don't need, and then also incentivize those, that middle level leadership. Um, to do something innovative, and I know it's 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 innovation is used a lot, and then in industry it's the same deal. How do you incentivize your people to to act the way that you want them to, and take the risk that you want them to, and then ultimately demonstrate that you are providing top cover when they do fail in taking that risk? And I think that's something that um, we can affect now. But yeah, personnel is, is huge. Okay, Dave. If you peel back the problem acquisitions or contracts to the root cause, well over 90% of the time, the root cause isn't the people who did the contracting, it isn't the uh, availability of finances, it's the requirement statement. And so if there was one thing I could fix, I would fix the requirements process, not just in DOD but across the government. How that requirement is, is de developed and defined shapes the whole rest of the process and our panel's work at www.section809panel.org <laughs> only talks briefly about it. I, I think uh, <clears throat> this is parodying some of what I heard last night at the dinner, but uh, I think Kim has some fantastic uh, commentary and ideas, so I won't steal his thunder, but I will say re removing oversight and the number of people that have not con direct control on your org chart over what you're doing, but have an ability to exert or delay your ability to do your job. And I'll, I'll let it be generalizable at that because it's, it's nuanced by agency by agency. But the reason why I suggest that is delay in time is a cost in and of itself. So I realize we absolutely want to be methodical. We want to be good stewards of uh, taxpayer funds. But taking our time imposes costs on us it's like a tariff, right? A tariff is a tax on us, not a tax or we're not screwing anyone else. We're literally screwing ourselves in the short term, hoping that 
we achieve a long-term effect. We do the same thing now by taking our time. And we know, if you were to ask anyone, why did you take your time on this? They would never say, well, because. They would say, well, I've got 57 people that either have the ability to like, pull the brakes on what I'm doing or have the ability to delay a week or two at a time. And all that adds up. And then here we are, the proverbial 18 to 24 months later. So that oversight has to be trimmed down um, other people will actually, fortunately, other people will talk about it later today, so I don't have to go on. But just remember, time is a cost in and of itself. Uh, so try to limit that if you can, and I'll stop there. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for your participation and your insight. Thank you all for your attention. And I believe it's time for a break, but I'll let Charlie uh, or uh, Jerry say that. But thank